this is my 12th book, it's just come out, Tumor. And there's a little parallel because my grandmother had 12 children. And I'm trying to figure out which is worse, like having 12 kids or 12 books. <laughs> I think they're both like equally pretty draining. Um, but this is November, and I wanted to start off by reading um, a kind of contemporary poem about Remembrance Day. On the 11th hour of 11, 11, 11, I am at Winners with the other bargain hunters, the early Christmas shoppers, the board. It's soggy, miserable out. The sky has swallowed all the light, sunk into a grayed puff of dirty down. Trenches of rainwater in the road, burnt leaves mulching underfoot, morning of seagulls. A clerk's voice breaks into the piped-in 80s music to remind us of the day. She stumbles over a few lines of Flanders fields, announces a minute of silence. Who knew 60 seconds could be this long? We rotate round the racks of marked down designer clothes in the uncomfortable stillness. I glance around. There's nothing on anyone's face, just a slight frown of concentration as a sweater slips off a hanger, a flinch of irritation at being bumped by a stranger's cart from behind. My friend Si Ming, who was 10 years old during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, remembers the meager two meals a day, going without the luxury of socks or sweets. Remembers the crowd peering into a bucket on the sidewalk, a street urchin's head discarded after the rest of him had been used for food. The relentless rain drills the windows. In the distance, the jet roar of thunder. What a relief to be inside this bunker, bathed in artificial heat and light, training our sights on the perfect winter coat, holiday dress. Finally, the tinny music cranks up again, and we relax, relieved of the burden of remembering. Some young woman is singing about love, how love is like a battlefield. <laughs> I'll return to this uh, collection later, but I'll read one more poem from it from now because um, I was thinking at our workshop, all of us were women over 40. And you know, one, of, one of the writers was talking about how you know, doors close as we get older, and they certainly do. I mean, the lives that we you know, envisioned for ourselves, which when we were younger, you know, there was all sorts of time to go off and have those lives, they diminish. Um, so this is about that. It's called Goodbye, Santa Monica. The horizon's gone, buried beneath a froth of smog, flat, blank glare. At the end of the pier, bobbing sailboats and veer of vertigo, the measureless water, seesaw of wavelets, tilt and tug of the tide. You thought you would have landed here long ago, lived as if inside a movie, caged in glass and polished concrete, one wall a blue ocean. Blood orange sunset drizzled in a line across the sky. Now you are middle-aged, repentant most days, lost among the advancing young on the third street promenade, their tidal beauty sweeping you aside. Say goodbye to houses the size of plantations, the Ferris wheel and the fortune teller, this life you swore would be yours two decades ago in a motel on ocean, a tiny surfer tangled in the waves through the speckled window. Goodbye to the fringe of palm trees, birds of paradise with exploded beaks. Goodbye to the homeless population, stretching and scratching on their benches at dawn, muttering prayers or incantations over their midday meals, swaddled in terry cloth like housewives. Goodbye to the big blue bus, the Bible thumper reminding you of your sins, the copper man with snakes strangling his arms, the girl with nothing but her guitar. This room without a view, facing away from the Pacific. 
At last you are here at the end of the pier, cradled by water and tired flesh and bone, seasick, looking for land. Um, we'll go to an earlier book now and back to childhood. Um, this poem attempts to capture the, uh, the claustrophobic nature of, of, that some childhoods contain. It's called Blindness. The day he went into the hospital for the operation, my father turned to me and said, if anything happens to me, you are the eldest. You will look after your mother and sister. Then he walked down the carpeted stairs and into the garage. I sat speechless, 10 years old and terrified. He was losing his sight, a black shade slipping down from the top of his vision. My father, who lived his life in a state of near blindness, the family around him, a blur of projections, a parade of half-seen faces. My mother blamed it on the way he slept his head hanging off their pink bedspread like a dog's, a contented grin on his dreaming face as if he had at last escaped before she hooked him back, dragged his body ashore. The day he left, she would not look at him. My mother offered no mercy even when he paused by her side for a word or touch. In her mind, he was already dead and buried like her own father, done with. I sat on the floor staring after him, the world squeezing into a slit of disappearing light. I thought, if anything happens to him, if he leaves me alone with her, I will never make it out of this house alive. still thinking about Hugh's um, manure poem. <laughs> Especially the mound of turnips. Like, nobody here is going to be able to look at turnips on the plate ever again. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, feelings towards turnips don't change as you get older. <laughs> well, you know, poetry versus prose. I'd really hoped, you know, long, long time ago when I started out that I would be a best-selling genre writer. <laughs> not a starving poet. Um, so yeah, if I'd had my druthers. But you know, there are things that poetry expresses that prose cannot. And in fact, you can write about the same situation in poetry and it doesn't have the potential callousness or maybe exploitiveness that people might see in a prose version of the same issue. So years ago, um, during the Picton trial in Vancouver, I'm sure all of you were reading about it in the papers and we were consumed with it back home, the Globe and Mail asked me to write a column about it and I just didn't feel comfortable about that. So I ended up giving them a poem, which they published. And the sort of the, um, the viewpoint I took was, I mean, partly just being a woman, you know, reading this, but also having been on the street and feeling it physically in my body as I was reading about these, these women he had killed. So, the Picton trial. Turn off the news, the sages say. Turn your attention to the world within. But it's the same world, seared in the same images. The pig farmer, the murdered downtown east side women, the body's memory of prostitution. It finds you in your locked room, your soft bed, even when you turn the television off, push the newspapers aside, it's part of you, knit into your cells and neurons, the physical representations of experience. It's there in the swamp of depression, the sparked fuse of fear at an unexpected touch, the pulse of adrenaline that once said, tonight could be your last night. This car that detaches from the river of traffic to idle at your feet, the last car, the man's face and the glitter of his glasses, the last face you see, his rough and thrusting hands, your last human contact on this earth. 
How should we carry our pasts with us as a husk rattling in a corner of a box tucked away or as a tipped bottle of poison that pours through our remaining days? Nights you sink into burning baths, wash away the grime of the day's headlines, scrub at the handprints scorched into your skin. You want to bleach them out of you as if the milk bath were a bath of lye. But the body won't forget, won't sleep, won't wake to another day of detailed torment. Believe it or not, once I had a chance for me, believe it or not, Picton said, laughing. Yes, once you too had a chance to escape this city mapped in memory, these streets and alleys crisscrossed with their cryptology of pain, you had a chance, believe it or not. Something perhaps a little lighter. Um, this is where I envy people like Ian Kedekew. You know, he's got everybody roaring in, in their seats. And, and uh, yeah. Um, it's called The Mall, and it's kind of an ode to shopping. Um, I read it in Hong Kong at a literary festival to um, a group of teenage girls, or maybe 13, 14, who during my reading were busily texting under the table and having a little nap, you know. <laughs> Nothing was resonating with them. Then I read them all, they all suddenly perked up. And uh, the teacher came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, she's been teaching them Chinese poetry and it's all, you know, monks sitting on mountaintops and, you know, they just cannot um, connect with that at all. But they all love to shop. And so the idea that you can write poetry about what you love, you know, it it's, should not be a radical concept, but somehow we're expected to be as poets, you know, beyond these material um, <laughs> things. But I do some of my best thinking in the mall because it's such a weird place. <laughs> Today, I choose it over the ocean, over the trees, their fall leaves, a flock of orange parrots perched on branches, over the chandelier of sunlight broken on blue waves, over flowers shaped like teacups or trumpets, over the jade garden where once I dreamed I wore a green velvet dress clasped tight at the waist like the grip of a man's hand. I walked towards it like a zombie, this strange planet suspended in time, a space station in the rainforest inhabited by teenage girls wearing glitter eyeshadow and slippery lip gloss. I skate along its arid walkways as if on an invisible track away from my life. Here it could be day or night, the walls stripped of clocks, music moaning a mindless refrain, not a window in sight. The stores hold their mouths open like seductresses, radiating heat and light and a bright array of wares, a sorbet rainbow of merchandise delectable as pastilles. Outside, the lives of grasses and insects and breezes go on. After a day at the mall, stepping back into what's left of the world, the sunlight will sear your skin and the gallons of fresh air will pour over you like pain. Um, Hugh's poem about his, uh, his friend with that sort of that severe depression, I like the way you spoke of it, um, because, you know, so many of us, and of course so many of us in the arts, I think particularly, it seems to lend itself to, who knows which is the chicken or the egg, right? Did the depression come first or did the art come first and which led to the other? But, you know, then there's like this whole other level. Um, and I had, um, for years as a young woman, I, I, as a teenager, I had a, a therapist who was, um, you know, struggled with depression in a way that I've rarely seen, and he ended up taking his life. So this is called The Wake. The day your daughter called, her voice small and shell-shocked, I went deaf. The long silence, the falling through snow. At the wake, your mother waltzed in her teal dress, arms outstretched to an invisible partner. 
Your father clawed at his cane, tears standing like stale water in his eyes. Photographs along the bar showed the you I never knew, wearing a snowflake sweater at a family Christmas, dancing at your daughter's wedding, a rose in your lapel. We survived you, your patients who filed one by one that afternoon into the restaurant, razor scars sliced into our arms. We were the ones who suffered at the top of our lungs, the suicides who would not die. How careful we were with our pills and potions, careful in our calibrations as pharmacists, just enough to draw attention, not enough to harm. They say that when men do it, they only need to do it once. With women, it's all crying out and complaining. You only had to do it once. Showed us it was easy, like shutting a door, turning out a light. On our last walk along the seawall, you stopped mid-sentence to watch a heron pass us in flight. Isn't she beautiful, you whispered, the stone span of her wings textured like granite. And I looked and looked again and saw, like those hours in your lamp-lit office, the gold light falling all around us. Then I came to the end, the last photograph. You, who were everyone's father, look her after. You were a baby, tumbled onto your tummy, gasping in laughter. You were so small, I could have held you in my arms. Who knew the black dogs were circling, snarling, waiting to take you into their jaws? So this is a very small meditative poem that ends the collection. Um, I was recently in Maryland, of all places, invited there by, I mean, poets are wonderful supporters of other poets. And as it turned out, there was a poet there who'd been following my work. Um, he also started very young, and he's also been quite prolific. And our first books actually came out at the same time. And so reading together was just amazing because it was, you know, we're, here we are separated by so many things, you know, gender, experience, you know, geography, and yet a lot of the same metaphors popped up in our work. We are going like, hey, who stole from the other person? Um, but just a lot of the same concerns as well, too, and the same... Anyway, he was also very wild as a young fellow, and Jerry La Femina is... La Femina, is how you pronounce it, is his name, if you ever look up his work. He's amazing. <laughs> Um, but he's also kind of gone through an arc where, you know, now in his late 40s, his work is kind of more meditative. So we kind of, you know, talked about that arc. Um, so this is a little poem called The Heron Returns to False Creek. There he was, standing by the water, wearing his frayed Chinese silk dressing gown, his beak the color of copper or hammered gold waiting all day for the flash of a fish in the stunned water. Imagine being blessed by faith to see this as a sign, a visit from the afterlife. Your spirit reincarnated into this patient fisherman, standing like a mourner on the shore, head bowed, robed in silence. Above, the boiling white clouds blown apart in the blue sky. The vault of sunlight burning down. You are no longer anywhere in this world. Hmm, I'm wondering if I should risk reading a poem I haven't read before. <laughs> You never know, right? Because sometimes the work, you know, on the page works and it doesn't work out loud, so... Um, but we will try this. Um, Middle-aged women have said that this has really spoken to them, or just people in midlife in general. It's a very weird thing to be in midlife. You know, you're neither here nor there. In, you're invisible, you know. You spend all your youth complaining about being stared at all the time and hassled, and then <laughs> before you know it, <laughs> there's none of that anymore. <laughs> um, so this is called Midlife, and it has a little quote from Updike called, um, the quote is, distance improves vision. <laughs> Some days you are bored with beauty. The sun takes decades to set. 
Above the yellow Adirondack chairs, a cloud of gnats whirl, black dots twisting in a spiral against the sky. Their happy, hopping dance, a tease, a torment. You waited all winter for summer, suspended like a sickly fish in seaweed green water, yearning for a glint of light at the surface. Last week in the dim sum restaurant, your face in the smeared mirror among all the black-haired heads could have been anyone's. Your family tragedies, any families. Just today you learned your neighbors in Afghanistan, his brother court-martialed, for shooting a wounded Taliban fighter to end his suffering. What made your grief so singular? The couples on the seawall march on, promena promenading beside the creek in a trot, <coughs> ignoring the heron on his log, the gold unfolding on the horizon. There's the sense we've been around too long, spoiled things, these concrete towers with shoddy windows shifting inside their frames. The sky would not miss us if we were gone. Honey in the air, shavings of cut grass, excrement, sweet breeze through the lime green trees. This crowding sensation in the head, the way words used to swarm you like bees, furious to escape into the world. Now the long tracks of silence, but who knows? a silence perhaps as worthy as noisy labor, the way the contemplation of a simple object, bruised pear in the bowl, lump of sea glass on the sill, might squeeze more meaning out of the moment than all this frantic busyness we're praised for. You've come to the place of not knowing, surrender maybe, where even the enamel sky of summer is crazed with lightning. So this is your home at midpoint, ruts in the faded carpet, limp cacti dreaming of the desert, furniture too worn to support your weight, sunspots on crumpled book jackets, blotches of mildew on blinds, angry crossing out strokes of erasure against the grain of the cherry wood desk. Decades passed, parking lots turned into high rises, high rises into leaky condos, the trees grew so tall, even your neighbors disappeared. <laughs> I'm always paranoid about going over time, so I'm going to end with a few poems about the body, which I had great fun writing. Um, you know, again, uh, getting into your 40s and going, oh my God, what's happening? Um, <laughs> um, I hear it gets worse, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> really, I should be enjoying <laughs> this moment. <laughs> it's not going to get any better. Um, OK, so I went through the body from top to toe. And I'll read you three and, and end with these three. Um, first one is gallbladder. I don't know if any of you have had gallbladder problems. <gasps> Really? Oh my gosh. I mean, so you know the pain, right? It's... That's in the poem. Yes. You know it. Yeah, it's... It is... Yeah, it's a whole other level of pain. So, yeah, and it's right kind of here. I mean, you don't even know, like, you know, you have a gallbladder until it starts letting you know that <laughs> it's there. Who knew you were even there? Tucked under the liver... A shriveled and sunken pear, small sack, treasure bag of stones, a stitch in my side. You are chewing me up from the inside, your constant gnawing, your spastic contortions bruising the liver, sending its gamma readings soaring. When you attack, women say, it's like childbirth without the happy ending. <laughs> you wake me in the night, Announce yourself just under the rib cage, to the right, you who slept so soundly for decades, pink and plump, now fiercely awake and complaining, mottled black and diseased. I've fed you a rich diet of sugar and fat, groomed myself into alliteration, the typical gallbladder patient, a fat, fertile, 40-year-old female. 
<laughs> That's true, but you don't fit that. <laughs> so, the surgeon wants to snatch you, wiggle you out from the nest of innards, and extract you through a slit in my side. But I want you to stay a while longer, your little screeching voice, your bilious mouth pushing out and pushing out its stuck stones wedged in your neck like olive pits. You keep me in thrall with your appetite for pain, your possibility of rupture. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like having a built-in cyanide pill, you know? <laughs> Not a bad thing to have. Um, so this little poem is about the vagina and how, you know, that even, even that part, like, you know, women talk all the time and men too about how their bodies change with age, but somehow, you know, I mean, you don't think that part's going to change, but why wouldn't it if every other part changes, right? So the indignity of seeing you change, even you. Your lips used to be springy to the touch a miniature trampoline, a little fat cushion of flesh. It seems someone let all the stuffing out. <laughs> now the inner labia, once so tidy and trim, are stretched and distended and sometimes poke out like the tip of a tongue in a cruel tease. That's all you want me to say about you. Lately you've grown reticent as a maiden aunt in your middle age desiring flannel nightgowns and 10 o'clock bedtimes. <laughs> so open to proposition in your prime, it won't be long before you grow a white fur, prepare for hibernation. <laughs> See, it's well past my bedtime here. <laughs> So I will end with this poem at the toe part, feet. And I remember as, um, oh Tanya, you were talking about your you know, clunky shoes, right? And I've, yeah, I went from wearing high heels to clunky shoes because of bad feet. But I remember as a teenager, I had a, a woman friend in her 40s who said, you know, I know you're not gonna listen to any advice I give you, but please just listen to this one little bit of advice, which is stop wearing high heels. You know, wear sensible shoes, you'll be grateful for it. And of course, I couldn't even listen to that one little bit of advice, so. <laughs> Now we're paying for it. So, feet. A doctor once exclaimed, those are some ugly feet. <laughs> These days, you don't even look human. Nothing like a model's feet in a magazine. Slim and straight as kayaks, squelching in the sparkly sand. You resemble the plaster model in the podiatrist's office. <laughs> The one he uses to demonstrate deformities. <laughs> Your bunions, knobs of throbbing bone at the base of the big toe, have given birth to bunionettes. <laughs> Which is actually a thing, although I don't think that's their clinical name. Your hammer toes are scrunched into claws as if forever trying to grasp at something not there. Plantar fasciitis renders the morning's first steps like those of the mermaids on land, a dance on knife points. Still, I feel a motherly affection for you, the runt of the litter, take you into my hands on winter nights and rub. Caked with calluses, studded with seed corns, you are like the old woman on the bus who wears a purple hat strung with birds and fruit and jingly bells. <laughs> a dropout in the race for beauty, conformity. The years I stuffed you into stilettos, long gone. Now I coddle you with custom orthotics, sensible shoes, cozy as moccasins. Soon you'll be granted your lifelong wish and live out the rest of your days in Birkenstocks. <laughs> you'll be walking on air. Thank you.